my name is Nina Marino, and I'm the Director of the Office of Child and Family Services at the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. I would like to welcome you all to the 2022 Children's Mental Health Awareness Day celebration. You are the caregivers, advocates, parents, and policymakers who work every day to care for and improve the lives of children. The National Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, sets aside the first Thursday of each May to emphasize that positive mental health is essential for children's healthy development from birth through adulthood. This day gives us an opportunity to renew our commitment to the prevention of mental health issues before they develop in children and intervening as early as possible with children who might be at risk for adverse childhood events, traumatic stress, or other developmental factors that can impact their mental health. We know that one out of every five children experiences a mental health issue in any given year, and one out of 10 of those children will have a severe mental health issue. But when treated, children and adolescents with mental health problems fare better at home, in school, and in their communities. And yet, we know that 75 to 80 percent of children and adolescents in need of services do not receive them due to a myriad of factors. Those include things like stigma, lack of access, difficulty navigating a complex and confusing service delivery system, as well as our severe and persistent workforce shortages we have right now that are causing delays in services being available. So we're working to address the access and consistency of services and respond to the effects of the pandemic by expanding access to quality behavioral health care services for children and adolescents across the state. We've recently provided over $7 million in one-time funding to support school-based mental health services to address the significant needs that kids are experiencing right now as they have come back to school this year and um, many of whom were not able to receive treatment during the pandemic or because of social isolation or family stressors are now having some challenges in terms of integrating back in school. The goal of this is to provide more integrated care in settings where kids already are so we can intervene earlier. We're also expanding youth peer support partners in treatment for adolescent and transition age youth who have problem substance use. And we're expanding adolescent substance use services through both workforce development to better equip our mental health workforce in screening and brief intervention of substance use, as well as funding for new treatment services specifically for this population. We're also partnering with a local agency on a recovery high school pilot for young people who are in recovery of substance use and to provide them with a school environment that is supportive so that they can stay in recovery and also graduate on time. We really are excited about this and hope this can be a model for other, um, for other areas across the state once implemented. And then over the past couple of years, we've partnered with pediatricians and family practice doctors from across the state to enhance their training that they receive in behavioral health issues for children and also to provide them with access to child and adolescent psychiatrists through a consultation line, as well as licensed mental health professionals and care navigators that can assist the doctors and the families in locating the best community-based services for children and families. That way we're treating the whole child in a primary care setting, which is often where these issues first come to light. So despite all of this, we know that we are in a national um, emergency for mental health for children due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as other social factors. The Surgeon General, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists have all recently sounded this alarm. Additionally, during the pandemic, pediatricians and other healthcare professionals have seen an exponential rise in youth and young adults admitted to the hospital with suicidal thoughts and attempts. According to the CDC, teenage emergency room visits for suicide attempts increased significantly during the pandemic, with a 50% rise in cases in females and about a 4% increase in males. And so with that in mind, we have chosen resilience and hope, youth suicide prevention, as our theme for this year's Children's Mental Health Day recognition. And we've comprised a great um, panel of subject matter experts for you who are going to deliver the most up-to-date research and resources regarding youth suicide prevention. I'm incredibly thankful for their time and energy to do this panel for you. We hope that you find it helpful and enriching and a source of practical stat strategies and solutions. Please feel free to share this recorded discussion as you would like and you can watch it at your convenience. 
And as always, we will continue to partner together to help our young people and families have the best opportunities for success and abundance in their lives. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here today to discuss this extremely important and timely conversation. As a content warning, this will be a conversation about suicide and suicide prevention. So certainly feel free to pause the video. Uh, this, this topic can impact people in a variety of ways and certainly want you to take care of yourself. My name is Justin Wallace. I'm the Suicide Prevention Coordinator at the Virginia Department of Health, and I'll be the moderator for roughly the next 60 minutes. As a way to frame this conversation, I'm gonna introduce each of our panelists, read their bio briefly, and then we'll spend the majority of time focusing in on some questions. Each question will be directed to a specific panelist, and then we'll open it up if other panelists want to chime in with some additional points. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into our speaker bios. Betsy Bell currently serves as the K through 12 Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Programs Coordinator for the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services and the Virginia Center for School and Campus Safety. Betsy received her undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia, a Master of Counseling and Development from George Mason University, and has background in school counseling and youth suicide prevention. Betsy, thank you for being here. Rebecca Texter currently serves as a behavioral health wellness consultant with the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. Her current role includes the oversight of the state opioid response grant and support for the suicide prevention program, Lock and Talk Virginia. She has earned a Master of Prevention Science degree from the University of Oklahoma and has worked as a substance abuse prevention professional within the Virginia Community Services Board system since 2010. Rebecca, thank you for joining us today. Lauren Yerkes is the Injury and Violence Prevention Epidemiologist at the Virginia Department of Health, providing subject matter expertise, data analysis, technical assistance, and consulting on injury, violence, and substance use data to inform state policy and program planning. Lauren has a Bachelor of Science in Human Development from Virginia Tech and a Master of Public Health in Epidemiology from the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine and is certified in public health by the National Board of Public Health Examiners. Lauren, thank you for being here today as well. And finally, Victoria Kirby York is the Deputy Executive Director of the National Black Justice Coalition. In this capacity, she is responsible for managing the operational policies and efficiencies of the organization, strengthening the organization's grass grassroots constituency engagement efforts, and leading the advocacy and action agenda. She most recently served as the Deputy Director for the Advocacy and Action Department at the National LGBTQ Plus Task Force, and has been organizing in a variety of capacities over 20 years regarding a number of progressive issues and candidates at the federal, state, and local level. Victoria earned her Bachelor's of Art in Speech, Communication and Rhetoric, and a Master of Public uh, Administration from Howard University. Again, thank you all to the panelists for being here on Children's Mental Health Awareness Day. So I'm gonna switch over here to some questions and then we'll jump right in. The first question is for you, Lauren. Um, what does suicide prevention or suicide in youth look like throughout Virginia? What's the data telling us? Um, what kind of populations are impacted? Age groups, are there differences in geography? What can you tell us about that? Sure. So when we are talking about suicide data, I do wanna start out by saying that it is important to look at data in several different ways. So we do want to look at data from where are the hospitalizations, the emergency department visits for self-harm or the deaths by suicide have the highest numbers. But we also want to look at maybe those populations that don't have the highest numbers but have increasing trends. We want to look at those populations. And finally, Sometimes the data don't tell us the whole story because we don't have really good data or numbers on hospitalizations or deaths of certain populations. So we have to look at 
risk factors that those populations may share that may put them at higher risk for suicide. So I want to throw that out there to begin because I think it will provide some context for today's discussion. We know that suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth 10 to 24 years of age. And we're going to focus on that particular age group for today's data discussion because it ranges from the early middle school time period to right after the undergraduate um, college or university time period. And this has been consistent for the past year, five years from 2016 to 2020 in Virginia is that it's the second leading cause of death. But what we also know is that when we look at data from emergency department visits and inpatient non-fatal hospitalizations for self-harm, we also see some increasing trends. So from 2016 through 2021, emergency department visits due to suicidal ideation, self-harm, or suicide attempts in Virginia almost doubled among the 10 to 24 year old age group. And then we also have seen a little over 4,400 non-fatal self-harm hospitalizations in from 2016 to 2020. And there was an increase of 4% from 2016 to 2020 of non-fatal self-harm hospitalizations. This was really driven by the 10 to 14 year old age group. So we're really seeing an increase largely in that middle school to early high school age group here in Virginia in terms of hospitalizations due to self-harm. This also has a lot of implications, not only for the health of youth, but also um, in terms of how much self-harm hospitalizations cost. So in 2020 alone in Virginia, self-harm hospitalizations that were non-fatal for youth 10 to 24 cost $24 million um, and a length of stay of 29 or 2,914 days in total of youth being in the hospitalized for self-harm related events. So, and we're talking about deaths by suicide. Deaths by suicide have also increased among the 10 to 24 year old population from 2016 to 2020, about 17%. So there were 197 deaths in 2020 among this age group, but this was not statistically significant. So we saw the same number of deaths by suicide in this age group in 2018 in Virginia as well. Um, but what we are seeing is that the majority of deaths by suicide are due to firearm. So in 2020, 61% of deaths by suicide in the 10 to 24 year old age group were by guns. And this is very different from if a person was hospitalized for self-harm where over nine out of 10 of those hospitalizations were due to a drug poisoning. And that can be either an over-the-counter drug or that can be a drug that was prescribed to that person or somebody else. So I also want to mention, Justin, you talked about certain populations that we're seeing and, and where suicide or self-harm may be impacting. And so I want to talk first about the populations that have the highest numbers. So in particular, we are really seeing this interesting dynamic of self-harm hospitalizations and ED visits among females, in particular young females. So mirroring the national findings, we're seeing an increase in emergency department visits for suicidal ideation and self-harm and suicide attempt among young females. And when I'm talking about young females, I'm talking about like the 10 to 14 year old age group. We're seeing that also in Virginia. 
um, there was a 67% increase from 2016 to 2020 in non-fatal self-harm hospitalizations among girls or females um, aged 10 to 14 years of age. So we're really seeing an increase there. And in general, 68% of non-fatal self-harm hospitalizations are female. So a majority are, are female in terms of being hospitalized. But we see a different story when we're talking about deaths by suicide in youth, because those are more predominantly male. And so there's an interesting look at when you're talking about hospitalizations, most of them are drug poisonings, majority are female, but then you're looking at deaths by suicide, most are male or majority are male and majority are by firearms. So there's a really difference in terms of by sex and by lethal means. And when talking about females in particular, we also have data looking at the health behaviors or the health characteristics of um, females and males um, by middle school and high school students. So there's a survey that's asked every other year in Virginia. It's called the Virginia Youth Survey. Um, it is a CDC or Centers for, Con Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, survey on health characteristics of public, middle, and high school students. And Virginia has been asking these questions for quite a long time now. And what we're seeing is that every year that the survey is asked, so we have data from 2013, 2015, 2017, and the most recent that we have available is 2019. And we're seeing that females are statistically significant in terms of considering suicide, making a suicide plan, and attempting suicide, and feeling sad and hopeless than males. And this has been the same findings for middle and high school female students for all of the data years that we have. So it's really important to think about not only the data and the numbers to see the majority of what's happening, but also the health behaviors behind some of this to inform some suicide prevention efforts. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about maybe populations that don't really have the high numbers, but there's an increasing trend. And I think this is important to note too. So in when we're talking about youth with concerning increasing trends, the population that comes to the surface is our Black Virginians, our young Black Virginians, age 10 to 24 years of age. So the deaths by suicide among Black youth almost tripled from 2016 to 2020. Um, so there are 49 deaths among Black Virginians aged 20 or age 10 to 24 years of age in 2020. And we also know that when we're looking at the total number of non-fatal self-harm self hospitalizations among Black Virginians, all ages, the 10 to 24 year old age group represents 39% of those. So a very large number of non-fatal self-harm hospitalizations are among the young black community. And then when we're looking at health behaviors, so the same survey that I talked about earlier, also similarly in 2019, 17% of black high school students who responded to the Virginia Youth Survey considered suicide, 12% made a plan for suicide and 10% attempted suicide. And that was statistically significant compared to their white peers. So we're seeing that black middle and high school students are significantly more likely to attempt suicide, think about suicide and make a suicide plan than their white peers. So that is another population that we really need to consider when we're thinking about suicide prevention. 
And the last population that I want to bring up is the population where we don't really have great numbers on the hospitalizations or the number of deaths by suicide because we don't ask questions of people when they're hospitalized for self-harm. And the population that I want to focus on for this group where there are shared risk factors that may put them at higher risk for suicide is the LGBTQ plus community. So we do not, when we're looking at numbers of hospitalizations and we're looking at numbers of deaths by suicide, we really don't have identified, if a person identifies as LGBTQ plus, when they die by suicide. So we don't really have that number. But what we do know and what we do have data on are the um, health behaviors or um, data from the Virginia Youth Survey that were asked of people who identify as LGBTQ+, and if they considered suicide, made a suicide plan or, or attempted suicide. And we know based on national research that LGBTQ plus youth are almost four times more likely to consider suicide than their peers who identify as heterosexual or another orientation. So 40% of US LGBTQ plus youth considered suicide in 2021. That is a really large number. And we're also seeing that here in Virginia. So using that same Virginia Youth Survey that we talked about earlier, that in 2019, the youth in high school in Virginia who identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, 42% of youth said that they considered suicide in the past year and 22% attempted suicide. And that is compared to their peers who identified as heterosexual, which was 12% that considered suicide and 5% that attempted. So statistically significant there as well. So we may not have the numbers to show how many LGBTQ plus youth are harming themselves and being hospitalized for that self-harm attempt. We don't know really great data on how many LGBTQ plus youth die by suicide, but we do have the health behavior data that we really need to pay close attention to and provide some suicide prevention efforts for that population. So those shared risk factors, it's important to consider all types of risk factors. And I know we're going to talk about that in our group discussion today, but I just wanted to share some really important populations that we're seeing here in Virginia. Yeah, yeah. I think you set the stage really nicely. I, you know, it, it's clear that uh, we can't just look broadly at suicide. We really do have to drill down a little bit more and look at distinct differences between populations so that we uh, better design interventions to save lives. So thank you for, for laying that out. We're going to kind of continue this conversation a little bit and, and answer some of those questions um, and points that you made with, with some of the other questions to panelists. Uh, before I jump into a question for Betsy, did anyone want to add anything to uh, what Lauren had laid out? Uh, less of an addition, more of a question around curiosity. Um, first, Lauren, thank you so much for, um, as Justin said, setting the stage. Um, so many important and valuable um, points. And, and I know part of the reason why the National Black Justice Coalition was invited to this space was because of the impact in Virginia, but also nationally around both the Black and the LGBTQ community. And to your point, because of lack of data, um, in many spaces, the intersection of those identities when it comes to Black LGBTQ plus youth. One of the uh, questions and, and curiosities that I have, but also that NBJC has more broadly, is whether there's been research kind of across departments 
um, in Virginia, and if you've heard about this elsewhere, that looks at medical research, especially around um, puberty hormones and how that might be impacting our numbers. Um, I learned from my own OBGYN that there isn't a lot of data on hormones, even for adults. And so um, th there are a number of, um, for both boys and girls, things that kind of take place and play out um, in that that age range that you said um, was 10 to 24, um, where you know hormones are doing different things um, medically. And so anyway, I've gone a little bit long, longer winded on the question, but I was curious if like your department and like the, the departments that you work in and like some of the more medical departments have done any, you know, um, connected work at looking at some of the health and physiological um, components of this? Victoria, that is a great question. And I think one that we really want to explore. I think that data is really emerging about that. Like you mentioned, um, I did read a couple of recent articles that talked specifically about the hormonal changes that happen during that time. And especially for young teenage girls and how um, their hormones might affect some of these um, suicidal ideation pieces that we're seeing. So I think we are just the very beginning of looking into that, but it's a really, really good question to consider and think about. And I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, and I'm going to add to that too, that along with those hormonal changes, um, one thing that we see a lot, especially in those middle school years, is the changing of social structures and the amount of anxiety that that can induce in kids can really impact their mental health, that change in the social structures, these lifelong friends they've had since kindergarten are now, um, you know, they're splitting into different social groups, social hierarchies are starting to develop, um, and so that can really impact, especially more marginalized populations um, of students and can really impact their mental health and mental well-being and can be a big contributing factor as well. So along with the hormonal changes, you also have those major social changes. And I think those go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually a good, a good segue into uh, the next question that we have for you, Betsy, which is, do we know, you know, suicide is a very complex issue. Do we know uh, what drives the trends that we observe? And then kind of part of that as well is just, uh, Lauren had touched on national trends. How does Virginia compare to, to the U.S. more broadly? So, yeah, so at the Center for School and Campus Safety, we do a lot of um, work in looking at school-aged kids and um, and different aspects of well-being in schools. And so part of that is, and I'll talk a little bit about the school climate survey because we do ask mental health questions on that school's climate survey. And it's a nice way to be able to compare where Virginia is with national data um, because the CDC data is fantastic, uh, but it's a sampling. So it doesn't hit every school in Virginia. It doesn't hit, it doesn't sample every child in Virginia. Um, the school climate survey is administered every other year in middle schools and every other year in high schools, so on the off years. So we really get that that 10 to 18 year old or 11 to 18 year old group. Um, it does unfortunately leave off that upper end and higher ed. Um, it would be a great way if we could get that data. Um, but we're definitely seeing the same trends very much in line with the national data. Um, you know, the most recent CDC data um, and I think Lauren talked about this a little bit, was that um, almost half of teens, so like 45% of teens um, said that they consistently feel sad or helpless. And that was, you know, the 2021 data from the CDC that was just released. Um, and 20% had seriously considered suicide. 9% of those had attempted, as Lauren had said. In Virginia, we're seeing 50% of middle schoolers in that same time timeframe um, had consistently felt sad or hopeless 
for two or more weeks and it had impacted their ability to function in their peer relationships and in their school um, and in their academic endeavors. So that's pretty alarming that there were 50% of teens who said that they had consistent or 50% of middle schoolers. Um, and then the data from 2020 for the high schoolers was similar, it was 52% of high schoolers had those same feelings. Um, so, so that really has a huge impact on how they interact with one another, how they interact in society and how they interact in their schools and how um, schools can react. If there's a bright spot in this, it's that 80% um, felt that there was somebody that they could talk to or could help them. So, so if, if we want to, if we look at the bright lining on this, um, is that 80% did feel that there was someone to talk to. What's concerning is we don't know if that 20% who felt there's no one to talk to fall in that category of consistently feeling helpless. And, um, and I think a lot of times, and this is my um, just anecdotal knowledge from working with um, this age group and these populations is that it's often the marginalized populations who feel there isn't someone they can talk to because they don't see representation of themselves in those helpers in the schools and in the communities. Um, and it's hard to talk to um, an adult when you don't feel like they're going to have a connection because you feel like there's nothing in common and they can't understand where you're coming from. Um, so so that's, that is also a concern and, and being able to find that representation for, um, for our youth to be able to have someone that they can turn to. Um, another bright spot is that um, over 70% said that if they heard a peer talking about harming themselves, whether it was suicidal or non-suicidal harm, that they would talk to an adult about it on their friend's behalf or on their peer's behalf. So, so that's also a bit of a bright lining as well, um, and that there are those who are taking that bystander role and, and, and speaking up. Um, but we are really seeing in Virginia that same trend from 2016 through 2021, which is the data that we have, um, we're seeing a huge upward trend in both suicidal ideation um, and suicidal attempt, and also in that non-suicidal self-harm. Um, as Lauren spoke about, that is um, more prevalent in our young female populations and in our minority populations, especially our African-American students. Um, so we don't have data on the uh, from the Center of School and Camp Safety on the LBGTQ plus populations because that's not a question that we're going to ask on the school climate survey. Um, but uh, but that's important data to also keep in mind and somewhere um, to really watch out for those populations as well. So I think, you know, and there's been so much almost collective trauma in our society over the last couple of years, obviously, we've all been living through a pandemic, we've all been living through isolation, we know that isolation is one of the risk factors um, for depression and for suicide and for suicidal ideation, and when we have um, young people who are already at risk and then we put them in these isolated situations, then we're going to have even more risk. And, um, and I think that that's somewhere we're really seeing that upward trend. Um, the most recent school climate survey just closed last week. So we'll have data from that in a couple of weeks available. I wish I had it for you today um, so that we could see where that 2022 um, trend is going, um, especially now that most of our kids are sort of out of that isolation. However, the transition back into the schools and into society, especially for some has been, almost as traumatic as that transition out. So, um, so I think, you know, we're seeing some of that as well. Uh, speaking with some folks over at UVA in the psychology department um, at the hospital, they were saying they're seeing more and more young people coming in for treatment, which is a positive, but it's also a huge uptick in the number of young people who are seeking treatment. Um, for anxiety and depression than they have seen in a long time. So, mm -hmm. you know, while you were talking, it really makes me think that while there's a lot of good mental health, mental wellness, suicide prevention work going on in schools, there's still a lot of need, you know, to continue to help um, build the capacity of our workers to support our students as well. Yeah. So I will say that that's also uh, um, 
a bit of a, a silver lining, if you will, or a bright spot is that schools really are taking um, the treatment and the support for student mental health uh, very seriously. And we're seeing more school counselors and schools. And in Virginia, school counselors are um, certified mental health personnel. So that's not true in every state, but that is true in Virginia. So to be a school counselor, you have to have that very specialized um, training in youth mental health. And, right. um, and we're seeing more other support, uh, mental health support, partnering with the CSBs to have on-site counseling and outpatient clinics in the schools, partnering with other uh, mental health agencies to have that in the schools and support in the schools. So, um, so that's very, very helpful. Right. Yeah, we're fortunate to have that. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're, we're well on our way, halfway through already. So I'm going to move right along here and switch gears a little bit. Um, this next question is for Rebecca, um, and it revolves around myths or misconceptions that are commonly held um, in communities. Um, you know, there's often this idea that talking about suicide will make someone want to um, consider suicide as an option. So Rebecca, for the question for you is just what myths exist in our communities? What are some facts that we can throw out to help support community members as they're helping to um, address this topic? Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, I, I first I wanted to, to, to say I appreciate um, the data that Lauren brought to us and uh, what Betsy was just discussing, because I think what I'm doing is definitely shifting gears here and talking about just to the people who may be um, coming to this panel discussion with questions about, well, I, I hear what's happening, I hear the trends, but what, what can I do about it? You know, I've heard that asking about suicide directly um, could give the, the idea to a young person who may not have thought about it before. But there, so my, my part in this really, I, I hope is to bring um, those of you who are here today to, to a hopeful place, because I'd really like for all of you to know that when you ask a young person if they are thinking about suicide, um, it actually opens a door and it gives people a sense of relief because what we have found is that um, by giving them an opportunity to open up and share what's troubling them or what emotional pain they've been dealing with, it gives them an opportunity to alleviate it, uh, to diffuse this pain a little bit. And it shows a young person in particular, number one, that they're not gonna get in trouble. You know, that's one thing as adults we forget about, you know, that sometimes young people feel like, well, gosh, if I, if I open up and, and tell an adult that I'm thinking about, um, you know, uh, planning a, a suicide attempt, that I might get in trouble for that. And that's certainly not, you know, what we want to convey to them. We certainly want to make sure we help connect them to care because, you know, we want them to have a rich life, to have a full life. So by being able to ask the really hard question, um, you know, are you thinking of dying by suicide? Are you thinking of killing yourself? You're actually saying, hey, you know what? I'm ready for a really serious open conversation about, uh, about this topic. And that can really help them take a breath. And number one, when someone says that back to them, you know, wow, first of all, they heard me. They've seen the amount of pain I'm in. They know that, um, that what I'm feeling is super serious to me, that this is a big deal and I need help. Um, that, that's huge. So I would say, you know, the first thing is being able to ask directly and clearly too, because when you think about what Lauren was saying about self-harm um, earlier today too, we have to be very careful how we ask the question, because if we ask a young person, are you thinking about harming yourself? It can be different in their minds than asking the question, are you thinking about killing yourself? Because in some regards, self-harm for younger people in particular can be about alleviating pain in a temporary situation, but not necessarily a suicide attempt. Um, and in, in another 
way you can look at this is if you say to a young person, are you thinking about harming yourself and you're meaning a suicide attempt, they may be thinking, well, the way I'm planning on dying by suicide won't hurt. I'll have it over quickly. Um, so we have to be pretty clear and direct. And that's a scary, scary place for an adult to be, uh, to have to ask that question so clearly and directly, but important. Um, and I, I think it may sound difficult for an adult to do this, but you may want to practice asking that question. And there may be people here today who um, are concerned about a young person in their life. They may be concerned about a student in their school. Um, and there's, there are a couple of things I, I ask all of us here would ask you to do. And number one is um, after hearing the data, after hearing some of the troubling trends that we've heard about today, talk to another adult after this panel and uh, kind of go over, you know, with somebody you care about and somebody you trust, go over how it's been for you to think and talk about this data today. And then in addition to take caring of your, for, taking care of yourself, I would like for you to also think in your mind at least through once or twice what it would be like to ask a young person, are you thinking about suicide? Maybe even say it aloud in the mirror. Sounds maybe odd to you, but practicing it and being confident is really going to convey that um, to a young person when you have to use that, when you have to actually ask it. Um, so yes, being clear and direct is important. So, uh, one of the big pieces of these myths that we're hampered by uh, over time is the fact that most people who are having thoughts of suicide don't necessarily want to die as much as they really want to alleviate that emotional pain or they want a way to um, you know, take control of their problems, but not necessarily die or not be here tomorrow, okay? So we have to also remember with a young person that sometimes that is not always as clear to them in, in just in this, their, their stage of development. Uh, it can be hmm, sort of an idea of, um, you know, there's a non-permanence about a suicide attempt. And, and I know that's kind of, that can be kind of difficult for adults to remember back to, but also consider that it's a part of uh, human development in their age group to think start thinking about their place in the world, about um, what would it be like if I was not here? Would people think about me if I'm gone? So in a way, that is a piece that's a very natural step uh, in, in gaining independence and um, thinking through their, what, you know, their personal identity and their needs as an adolescent. But if you couple that with the anxiety that comes with some of these social changes that Betsy talked about, and then some of these struggles that we see with um, different populations, perhaps not having someone who they trust as an adult who could really identify with their certain struggles or, or questions that they have about perhaps being um, a lesbian or bisexual individual, for example, uh, that can be really tough. So my, my hope is that as an adult, not only do we ask the question clearly about are you thinking of suicide if you're starting to see these signs, you know, these risks uh, stack up, but then also what is it in your life that's going on? Tell me more about what you're thinking and feeling. What causes you struggles throughout your school day? What causes you to have anxiety when you go home in the evening? Um, who do you feel connected to? Help them discover who their personal resources are so that they can find a mentor and so that they can find that, that trusted adult. And because it doesn't have to necessarily be that formal care that we're talking about because the school counselor is there for a certain part of the day, 
but they need connections to their informal care as well. Their coaches, their, their teachers who see them every day and have that face time with them in the classroom now that we're back in person. Uh, you know, and just because you get help once after, let's say a suicide attempt, know too that that young person is stepping back into a classroom. And there are people, the administrators, the friends, all those peers that are gonna be seeing the individual. And they're also, they're in a, a place of being able to help them um, recover and care for themselves as they move forward. So, I mean, the other piece of this is that sometimes adults think, you know, hey, if they're saying they're suicidal, aren't they just, you know, crying out for attention? Should I really be taking this seriously? Here's the thing, um, a cry for help is a cry for help. So we help. That's our job as adults, right? That's our job as a parent. Uh, it, and even if it's not necessarily going to lead to a lethal attempt, it's something we need to take seriously and show them that we take it seriously. Um, so keep that in the forefront of your mind. And to us, what that can mean are very tangible pieces. If, if, if they are saying to us, uh, I have been thinking about suicide, you ask them, okay, have you been thinking about a plan? Because you have ways that you can help disable that plan and show them that you're taking their thoughts and their feelings very seriously. Number one, when we look at what the, the data that Lauren's talking about with overdoses, and I'm talking about over-the-counter overdoses too, acetaminophen overdoses are on the rise, right? How easy a step can it be to lock that medication in a locking medicine box? even the OTC, because if they survive the attempt, there is still that long journey of recovery physically as well as mentally after they have attempted. You know, the damage that you're doing to your body is something that a young person is not thinking about in advance. Uh, and then the firearms piece of this, you know, 85% fatal. Uh, attempt with a firearm. If a firearm is loaded, if it is in the house, if it is accessible, if it is unlocked, uh, it is a temptation. And suicide attempts for younger people tend to be a little bit more impulsive than for those of us who are older. So please, we ask the adults to take the initiative to separate the ammo from the firearm and lock that firearm, remove it from the household. If a young person is telling you that they have, a, if they're not feeling good, if they are um, receiving some mental health care. Another piece of it is recognizing that they may be um, having a co-occurring disorder or a mental health challenge in, in conjunction with misuse of substances. A lot of times for young people, not only recreationally, but should just plain feel better. And we see that as Betsy talked about, you know, things ramping up as we're transitioning back into in-person, um, in-person learning and being around our peers more. Um, we need to consider the fact that they, be, they may be misusing substances just to get by and get through. Uh, and maybe have, they may be having a mental health challenge or, uh, a, a mental health disorder like depression or let's say even bipolar disorder that's surfacing for the first time and they don't know what to do with it and they're scared. So being a, an adult mentor is very important at this, at this particular time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Rebecca. Um, I think you did a, a masterful job of kind of landing that data airplane and grounding that in the steps that we can take as individuals in valuing our, our community members, um, our children, you know, in supporting them and certainly asking those questions. And we'll touch on a little bit about for those folks that are watching who are still a little on the edge about how we go about asking those questions, what kind of trainings uh, are available and out there that, that you can take to kind of uh, grow your skills and your comfort in asking those questions. And I also like your phrasing, bringing people to a hopeful place. I really, I really love that. 
it kind of reminds me of the uh, the creating communities that contribute towards a life worth living that's uh, often stated in suicide prevention work. Um, did anyone else want to add anything before we wrap up our our last question for individuals and uh, we'll we'll open it to the full panel. I just wanted to um, to just go back to something that um, Rebecca had talked about a little bit, and that's the access to means. Um, and when we are looking at the data, we do see that um, fatal suicide attempts um, tend to be more prevalent with those who use a firearm. And that is the preferred means of our young men and also our middle school population. Um, so, and that's true for both boys and girls in the middle school population. And then as teens get older for our young men. So while our um, girls are, tend to be hospitalized more for that self-harm, um, whether it's suicidal or non-suicidal self-harm, our boys are the ones who are actually dying by suicide more often because they do choose that more fatal means. And our younger kids um, and I don't, and I'm not 100% sure what the reason is. It might be influence of media because that's what you see as far as suicide attempt on media, or if it's um, just an access to means. So, so really taking those steps to lock away firearms, to separate ammunition from the firearms themselves and removing them from the home. If you do have a young person in your home who is showing um, depressive or suicidal behaviors is so important. So I really, really thank you, Rebecca, for, for touching on that because, um, because I think that is such an important part of prevention. Yeah. Go ahead, Victoria. Yeah, I have a follow up on that same piece around means that it's the first time this thought occurred to me, actually, in listening to, to what you shared, Rebecca. Um, do you have any sense or has there been any qualitative data or experiences um, you've had with, with young people um, that, leave, that um, connect this means piece around um, comfort with it like the the thing that came up for me is that you know not to say that little girls don't play you know what we call shoot 'em up games you know video games that you know are focused on like call of duty those kinds of games um you know so some of our boys who play those games more even if they haven't had as much practice with the real gun think that they understand how to to use you know a gun if put in their hands. Um, and for girls, once you start having your period, you begin using more pain medications, you know, once a month, you know, to deal with cramps. And so maybe less familiar with how to leverage a gun, but for sure has gotten used to taking pills regularly. Um, probably for, for many kids for the first time in their lives really having to take medicine more regularly and like how you know to what extent does um familiarity with some of these different um forms connect to it and relatedly um uh kind of following up on medication um there are also like prescribed medications sure. for asthma mm -hmm. allergies ADHD that have side effects for different people um, that sometimes include rare side effects might include depression or, mm -hmm. you know, that you just like when you get in the doctor's office, it, they just kind of give you the medicine and say, yeah, these are a list of side effects, but they don't really break it down to parents mm -hmm. or especially the young person. Uh, and so kind of my second question is to what extent are um, some of what our youth experiencing connected to medication that's not been properly explained? Mm -hmm. Those are all really big and good questions. First of all, familiarity with means is huge. Also the glamorization of certain means. Um, they're uh, particularly the idea of the graceful death, the peaceful suicide um, being something that can be very attractive about overdose. And I will tell you that the reality of overdose is not attractive, it's painful, it is, <laughs> you know, and I don't think that particularly the young, the young people who 
attempt by that means. They think they're gonna fall asleep and it will be peaceful. Um, they don't really understand the reality that a body fights for life. And there is, you know, there, it's, it's, it's very different than what uh, the picture we've been given of the Marilyn Monroe kind of quote unquote suicide. Okay, so, um, but I'm saying that's going back to like my generation, you know, I'm sure the, 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 the younger generation now they have their, their own um, ideas of, of a glamorized uh, death. Now, I will say too that um, certainly younger people are also influenced by, uh, you know, the, the deaths of people who are, are high profile. Uh, when we, we, we did see uh, more suffocation, you know, ha by hanging um, after we had seen national attention paid uh, to um, hanging deaths or suffocation deaths by Kate Spade. And then I think that same summer we had Chris Cornell, who was a, you know, a musician that, that, that young people loved or, um, and we had several, you know, high profile suicides. So yes, that does kind of um, cause some concern. And uh, the more familiar you are with a means, the more apt you are to use it. So I would agree with you on that. Um, and then the second piece of that, the Virginia Prescription Monitoring Program has helped to some degree with keeping the mm, more addictive pain medications to a minimum, but we have a long way to go with that. For example, there still is uh, ad addiction and overdose concern for sure, uh, particularly with the opioids. But also too, I think, um, when when you look at young young people and misuse of, of uh, prescription drugs, for example, it, it's often receiving drugs from friends that they shouldn't be taking, like Adderall when you don't need Adderall. <laughs> you know, I think that's another big piece of this. And it, you know, that can be a vicious cycle. And if you're already experiencing other mental health challenges on top of that. Um, can put you in a bad place really quickly. And, and truly anyone could be vulnerable to suicide thoughts. Um, it's, it's not, you know, you have to have this particular exact mix of risk factors. These things can build for an individual. Right, yeah, Victoria. So thank you for bringing those up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Excellent questions. Um, we wanna stick with you for a second here um, and kind of drawing this conversation back to some of the points that Lauren and Betsy had made about, you know, kind of drilling down on certain populations that, that we're, we're seeing uh, differences in trends around. So this question is for you, how does suicide impact LGBTQ plus youth and youth of color? What factors are at play that contribute to these groups experiencing suicidal thoughts and attempts? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, in the National Black Justice Coalition, we've co-authored a couple of reports that really dig into the question. Uh, I'm going to share some of the findings from that and also some of my own takeaways uh, personally. Um, the first report is one that we did called Ring the Alarm with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, and this was, we created this report um, about four years ago because we saw that there was a crisis around mental health and youth suicide within the black community, um, especially, you know, for our girls, it had it has been high, unfortunately, for a long time um, and just not really addressed. And, and for our boys, it they, it went from here to like here, <laughs> you know, and what has felt like overnight. Um, and there hadn't been a lot of attention paid to it. Um, certainly current events in, in terms of constantly watching, you know, um, Black boys, especially young kids like uh, Trayvon Martin, um, the young, you know, 12-year-old boy who was just playing with toy gun in the park, uh, Tamir Rice, seeing people your own age killed by uh, police officers and also gangs, right, in your own community, um, begins to um, play a toll, you know, have a toll on you, apart from the political discourse, just seeing the images 
um, itself um, has, has not been um, helpful. Um, and, and when it comes to the LGBTQ community and it's and also some regards the black community too, um, uh, the feeling of being different, um, not being included, uh, being purposefully excluded um, plays a huge role in um, self-harm uh, and suicidal ideation. Um, and one of the things that um, we, we've been able to do in partnerships for a, a subsequent report that we did with GLSEN um, was really drilling in on the intersection of Black and LGBTQ identities, uh, whereas the Ring the Alarm report included the intersection, it was more broader, focused more broadly on Black kids. Um, this report really drilled uh, drills down on the intersection, and you know um, the other ladies highlighted the lack of data on sexual orientation, um, gender identity, and expression. Um, the other place where there's a lack of really meaningful data is being able to get at the intersections and not just at race. Race is important, you know, especially important for the work that we do, but we also are curious looking at those intersections when it comes to religion, relig religion and religious beliefs and how that shapes and supports some people and is harmful for others. Um, looking at class breakdowns and like whether or not you go to bed hungry every night, whether or not, you know, you feel um, uh, guilty for existing because your parent has to struggle so much to provide for you, right? Um, uh, feeling smart and, and, not, and yet not supported, seeing college and, you know, not being seen as college worthy by your teachers right or your your friends um because of the way you present because your because your tomboy moment has lasted longer than you know society says it's supposed to last or you're a boy um you know who likes to wear fingernail polish and you hear your uh career counselor say well you can't do that in college right <laughs> or you're a trans student trying to navigate just using the bathroom and being turned into a political epicenter where just a couple of years ago, nobody cared that you used, you know, the nurse's bathroom and, and now your ability to just pee has become <laughs> this national <laughs> debate, right? Um, all of these conversations don't happen without our kids watching and listening and taking cues from the people around them about whether they're worthy. And so, you know, same thing happens around race when you hear, you know, I grew up in Florida. And so I feel for my my four nephews, four black boys, um, you know, all under the age of, of 14, who are now, you know, hearing that 240 math books were taking out, taken out of use because something black was mentioned in there, <laughs> you know, that that makes you feel otherwise, even if you don't understand the political debate that's happening around it, right? Even if that's outside of your, your real house. Um, I know for me, um, you know, I started having feelings of suicidal ideation as young as four years old. I didn't have the words for it. Didn't know how to talk to my mom about it. So I didn't. I didn't talk to my mom, honestly, about what I had been experiencing till I was like 30 years old. And I had been doing some of this work <laughs> professionally for a long time, right? Um, but I um, struggled with talking about it because it felt like my dirty secret, right? Like, you know, um, this isn't something that, you know, I would make my mother sad if she knew that I wanted to take my life. You know, and so I did try suffocation, you know, with a pillow. I did try, think, you know, I thought if I poked my eye out with the fork, you know, <laughs> at like four or five years old, I was like, that, that'll do it, right? So, you know, there are things that like, you know, like I think it was Rebecca that mentioned, or, or could have been Betsy, it was during that, that period in our, in our conversation where you talk about um, the means and what people see around them and, and think about without having the terminology or the words. I didn't know how to have the conversation with my mother and she never brought it up. And I certainly felt like I was the only one experiencing it. And in some ways, having a report that reflected both 
my racial identity and my identity as a um, same gender attracted person. Cause I also started having those feelings at four <laughs> um, and noticing, oh, that's not, I'm not supposed to like this person. I'm supposed to be liking this person who is opposite gender <laughs> and keeps, you know, trying to play with my hair. Um, who I just find irritating, right? You know, that's the kind of thought level that you have when you're preschool, kindergarten, right? Like you don't have some of these higher thoughts. Um, if I had the data that, wow, this large percentage of other Black kids felt this way, I would have been more comfortable to talk to my friends about it, to say, hey, you know, I heard that, you know, I'm not alone in this. Like, do y'all ever feel this way? We could have created more support systems, but I honestly felt like I was the only one feeling that way. And so I just took it to God and, you know, you know, prayed. And every time I would start to feel in that, I had my faith. So for me, religion was my saving grace. It was always like, oh, well, God's not gonna, I didn't care, honestly, as a young person, where my parents really were on it as much as I cared about what God would think about what I did. And so for me, that was my saving grace. I know for other LGBTQ people, um, I, I, I didn't have negative messages about that from the pulpit. So I, like all my faith experiences were positive, but I do know for others, that's not the case. And so they can't talk to their parents if part of their depression or suicidal ideation is because they identify as LGBTQ because they've seen their parents say amen and hallelujah when the pastor started talking about how being LGBT wasn't okay. And so it sends a message that, nope, can't talk to my parents, can't talk to my pastor. And, you know, I know people who didn't, who did not feel comfortable turning to God in that way. Um, and so um, I realized that I had a, a privilege in some ways um, that my experience was different. Um, so, you know, having the data, being able to share the data with parents and also in kid-friendly ways with kids, I do think, you know, helps to break some of those um, stereotypes, mysteries, myths, um, and, and helps to create an opening to be able to say, this is how I'm feeling. I don't want to feel this way. <laughs> What can I do about it? Because it's not always because of something sad. There, there, there can be children who have everything going great for them. Their parents are great. Their school is great. They're involved. They're highly functioning kids. And yet inside they're fighting this, this battle that they don't feel like they can win. And sometimes those students are even harder to reach because they're not, they they're not crying, at least not publicly. They're not, they don't look like they're sad. Sometimes, you know, these are the people that when they pass, folks will say, oh, they always seemed so happy, go lucky children, right? So it's important that we have these conversations broadly and not assume who needs to hear it and who doesn't need to hear it. That even though Black LGBTQ kids are at at a high risk, it doesn't mean that folks who are at low or mid-level risk don't also need to, to hear these conversations too. Um, the other piece around um, intersectional um, data and conversations is around cultural competency and understanding, um, especially within Black culture or other ethnic cultures. Um, and outside of some of the racial distinctions, right? Because there's so much about like, ethnic culture that breaks apart from kind of the racial barriers that you see. You know, how this comes up in Puerto Rican households and Afro-Latinx households um, might be different from how it comes up in a Polish household or uh, Irish or Italian household or indigenous household, you know, um, or a, a Mexican American or a, a Korean versus a Chinese. It's not just, on this racial spectrum, it's how how culturally does this come up or not come up? You know, there are some parts of death that are beautifully talked about in some Jewish homes that I'm just like, wow, I need to learn this, even though I'm not Jewish, because this is a beautiful way to talk about it, you know, that I think would resonate, especially in my community, because 
Um, in the Black church, we do spend quite a bit talking about within the Old Testament, things that happened in Jewish culture. So there are, even though it's through a different lens, there's a pathway of, under, of like interest um, that carries cross-culturally as well. And so being able to dig in and to learn some of, or even like when you talk about like Mexican Day of the Dead and, and, and how some of those conversations come up each year and what happens if the ancestor passed because of suicide? How are those conversations like impacting, you know, how the conversation goes and how can that be a tool for adults and that culture to, to talk about it, right? How does the movie Coco then become, you know, a, a tool to, to engage even more broadly across you know, lines of difference about some of these topics. So I know I've, I've gone on a bit, but there's there's just so much richness at the intersection that it's not just for, it's important for the communities directly impacted by that, but there's also so much learning that we're able to do and just learning more about each other um, and, and, and allowing that, you know, cultural salad, you know, of different, you know, identities and, and communities to help give us more ways to talk about this um, and, and, and areas that allow us to feel hopeful, as Rebecca said. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, well said. I, um, I hope people watching really digested that part. I certainly needed to hear that. And, I, and thank you for sharing thank your- you your lived experience as well, your lived expertise uh, on, on this panel. Um, and for talking about, you know, in public health, we talk about the social determinants of health a lot. Um, and just talking about those in such an easily digestible way, you know, the food access pieces, the, the living wage pieces, the, um, you know, all those elements, housing that contribute to uh, potential for traumatizing our, our community. So thank you for, for speaking to that. We're at a, we're a little over an hour. I do want to give the panel a second to, to ask any questions or chime in, but then we're going to jump directly into a really important piece that we want to include, which is what resources are out there for the community and, and a call to action, what trainings can be taken by community members um, but before we do that, did anyone want to want to comment on what Victoria said, or do we want to move right into um, providing some resources to the community? So, yeah, I just first, Victoria, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for for the way you express that because that's such important information. Um, and along with that, having those broader mental health discussions that are cross cultural, um, and a conversation with a remarkable young woman in Louisiana who. Um, survived a suicide attempt by firearm when she was 16. She's now 21. And um, there's actually a documentary about her. Um, her name's Emma Benoit. She's amazing. But um, talking about she didn't even recognize in herself the signs um, because mental health was never discussed in her home, in her school, or in her community um, as health. You know, she would hear things like, well, they're crazy. Like that was sort of the extent of mental health discussions. And it was always in a very negative um, way. And so to be able to have those discussions with our young people uh, about mental health and, and what mental health is and how to, um, and what those protective factors are and where to, um, to find your resources is so important. Um, and then taking that deeper dive culturally, uh, as you were saying into those, smaller populations and different populations and cultures and really having a deeper understanding of the best way to have those conversations there too um, is just so important. So I just wanted to thank you again for, for bringing that up. Thank you, Victoria. I really appreciated you, uh, everything you said and including your personal story because it brought me back to another myth about suicide that um, I wanted to address and that's simply that oh gosh, you know, if I get help for suicide thoughts, I'm going to be labeled for the rest of my life as the suicidal individual or somebody who, like Betsy said, who's, oh, we're crazy or whatever. It's not true. We, we go on to um, find that treatment works if we stick with it. And, you know, you can, you don't have to stick with one kind of treatment throughout your life, but you may find uh, someone who who really is helpful to you, or you might find multiple things that help you recover. Um, you can manage your mental wellness. You can learn and grow through things. And um, 
it, it's just, it's, and not everyone needs to be hospitalized who has had suicide thoughts either. So that's another thing. I think some, some young people are afraid to speak out because they're afraid that they'll, that they'll be locked away or, uh, you know, that, that, that they'll be in trouble or labeled for the rest of their lives. And that's just not the case. Um, we're, we're human beings and we can all become vulnerable uh, and we can all work through it. And especially if we find sort of our micro communities that you know can can help us, like you were talking about, Victoria, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, discussions about your mental wellness and um, it can make a big difference. Right, yep, exactly. Thank you all to the panelists. Um, let's wrap this up with a couple resources or, or trainings, call to actions. Um, we can just go around if there are specific pieces that individuals want to highlight, um, but feel free to jump in and, and um, really, really put some, some resources and trainings out there for the folks that might be watching this, uh, this, this panel. So I'll start because nobody else was speaking up. <laughs> so the Center for School and Campus Safety does a lot of, um, of training, especially for school personnel and for partnering law enforcement and other emergency responders um, and first responders, as well as some partnering communities. So PTOs, PTAs, um, families, caregivers um, on suicide prevention. So we have several suicide prevention trainings. We offer assist, we offer safe talk. We also offer, um, uh, suicide prevention that's specifically for schools and partnering law enforcement. Um, and then that aligns with the BDOE suicide prevention guidelines. Um, so to really help school communities, um, we have trainings on recognizing and supporting students with anxiety and depression. We actually have two of those coming up this summer, one on virtual and one in person. So those are June 13th and July 14th. Um, and we have a suicide prevention uh, virtual training on July 11th that's coming up. And then we have a couple of assist trainings that are coming up sort of on demand from different localities um, and different localities can request uh, the trainings. There's a form on our website to be able to do that. Um, so, so we have a lot of different um, mental health trainings that are available. Also some substance abuse um, and misuse for youth training. So recognizing the signs and symptoms and how to support and help our youth um, who are using um, those, those means, um, especially for the self-medicating for the anxiety and depression as well. So, um, so all of those are available and you can request them on our website and we're happy to come to you or provide them virtually. And as always, because we're a state agency, everything we do is free of charge to those um, localities. Right. And for those watching, they may hear the term gatekeeper training um, and just want to let folks know that that's just a term used to describe uh, things like the uh, assist training that Betsy was talking about that really arms uh, community members with the, the uh, ability to engage in these conversations around suicide, you know, identifying risk factors, getting folks to resources, that kind of thing. So gatekeeper is kind of the term you may hear from time to time. Um, Rebecca, do you want to talk a little bit about the Lock and Talk program and, and sure. some other resources as well? So uh, just to tag on what Betsy said, so part of Lock and Talk is the talk part of it. Uh, so we encourage people to take uh, gatekeeper trainings, and we uh, are also through the state agencies, the community services boards across the state. Um, we're offering many of those same trainings, sometimes in conjunction with uh, Betsy and her colleagues, and also Justin's colleagues. So uh, suicide intervention skills training, the assist, the safe talk, mental health first aid, also ACEs. So this is about um, working with young people who have had adverse childhood experiences. Um, so the, you can, if you're interested in finding out how to connect to trainings that are also the free trainings, they may be in conjunction with either uh, any of these folks here, um, but through it would be through our prevention services offices at our community services board. And one way to find out um, how to get connected is to go to the lock and talk spelled out lockandtalk.org website. And on the about us tab, there's a map of Virginia. 
and it has your 40 different community service board locations and a pin and you go to where closest to where you are you'll find a contact and that contact person will be able to tell you not only what trainings are coming up where they're going to be who's going to be teaching them but also be able to uh, connect you to the lock and talk devices that are free because of state funding um, so that you can give uh, items like gun locks and medication uh, locking boxes to community members, to parents, uh, to schools, just through their office. So uh, in addition, there are national resources on the lockandtalk.org website. So if you want to dig in some more, find out more links, um, you'd be able to find out links for uh, different populations, whether they be uh, youth populations or even uh, folks older too. Excellent, thank you. The, uh, the Virginia Department of Health also has a, uh, a landing page for resources as well related to suicide prevention. Um, and I, uh, for any counselors that might be watching this, I just wanna plug the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. suicidality. Um, it's an excellent training. Um, you can just uh, Google it, um, but it's uh, you know research informed, developed by, uh, uh, a well-known suicidologist, David Jobes. So I'd encourage any counselors on the call to, to look into taking that uh, training as well. Um, Victoria or Lauren, anything that you wanted to add before we wrap up here? Yes, um, so a few resources um, that I wanna share is of course our website, nbjc.org. Um, there's a resource page that includes the reports that I talked about, the Ring the Alarm report with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, as well as the um, uh, report we did with Glisten on Black LGBTQ youth. But there are also some um, really great partnerships that we have um, that I think is important to share. One is with Taraji P. Henson's. Um, a lot of people know her as Cookie from <laughs> um, the show Empire. Uh, but uh, she has a foundation that's completely focused on mental health support for youth, um, largely for youth. And um, the Henson Foundation creates opportunities for five free um, sessions uh, for young people. We have a partnership where we've been providing um, that support with licensed clinicians. Can also, um, uh, one of my favorite resource pages to go to because it links to everybody, all the other ones that I really love, is the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, also known as BEAM. If you go to their Get Help Now page, it has so many different hotlines and support centers that have a different cultural competency like built in. So there's Black Line, which is a um, prevention, suicide prevention hotline focused on the Black community. There's um, the Trevor Project, which is focused more broadly on the LGBTQ plus community. There's Trans Lifeline, which is focused on the trans community. And then there are several other substance abuse, um, more uh, broader minority mental health lines. And of course, you know the National uh, Suicide Prevention Hotlines um, that are there as well. Beam also has some of my favorite culturally competent graphics, both for um, people who are struggling and also for parents and um, you know, adults who are looking to find ways and friends who are looking to find ways to be supportive of folks going through um, this. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to share a couple big policy um, things that are in the in the mix that I want to ensure people know about. Um, the Biden Harris administration has increased some funding dollars that um, different states and organizations will be able to apply for to increase the number of mental health providers in your schools and in communities. Um, and a, a big piece of that is around peer support and coaching and trying to invest more in support circles and ways for um, people who are not um, licensed clinicians to have some better language um, to support. Because we don't have as many therapists, licensed therapists as we need for the, the number of people who need the support. And so one big stopgap as we train up our pipeline, right, is um, to have more of us lay folks, as I, as I say, uh, be able to um, get that knowledge 
Um, and there's also lastly a piece of legislation called counseling not criminalization, which is focused on getting more dollars poured into schools to ensure that um, there's enough uh, uh, programs so that every student who needs uh, deep mental health support can get it. But we got to get that bill passed. It is not a law yet. <laughs> I want to clarify that it's important to contact our lawmakers to, to share that this is an important piece. And Justin, I just want to add at the very end that it's important as we think about data, as we learn about data, and all of the wonderful programs that are available for suicide prevention. You know, these are not numbers, they are people. And they are people in Virginia, youth in Virginia, who um, should have access to all of these suicide prevention programs to promote health outcomes, to keep um, them healthy and supported and cared for and to address any risk factors that they may have. So I just wanted to highlight that data is just a component of this complex health topic. And while we look at numbers, they are, there are people behind the numbers. And that is really what we need to emphasize and think about as we promote and move this work forward. So thank you so much. Beautifully said, beautifully said. Um, I think I'll just add, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't include these numbers. While there are a variety of resources available to folks, I wanna make sure that anyone watching this film who is who this uh, panel session, who is experiencing suicidal thoughts is aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK, that's 8255, is available 24 seven. And the Trevor Project was mentioned as well, which is a lifeline for LGBTQ plus youth. And that number is 1-866-488-7386. I appreciate everyone uh, on this panel for being here and having this conversation with us today. It was fantastic. Um, take care, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And uh, we appreciate your time. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.